Hi, good evening and welcome to the um, CPDME webinar. My name is Andrew Umrod and I'm the facilitator for tonight's webinar and I'll be very shortly introducing you to uh, Dr. Mike Davis who will be doing the presentation. Okay, uh, welcome everybody um, to this um, uh, first of a series of webinars that uh, I'm going to be working on over the next few months or so. Um, as it says here, my name is Mike Davis, I'm a consultant in continuing medical education uh, and I work predominantly in um, uh, the life support community. Um, so if you've ever come across a uh, a life support course of any description, the chances are that I've had some engagement in that particular thing. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about some of the issues associated with uh, uh, the way in which educational theory can contribute towards effective um, uh, input into these programs. Um, I'm very keen that uh, we uh, have some of, something of a conversation around this. Um, so here on this screen is my um, Twitter handle, and uh, if anybody wants to make any contributions during the course of the uh, the talk this evening, they can either use that or the hashtag theory, and I'll pick those up. Uh, if you wanted a more leisurely approach to asking questions or making points, my email address is also uh, available on the screen. <clears throat> what we're planning to do in this short talk tonight is and um, specifically to talk about the extent to which uh, um, that to take, can take place successfully within a, um, a, a social context. And by social context, I mean with other people, not in a pub. Uh, it's the social context of the, more often than not the workplace, but doesn't exclude necessarily um, meetings in informal settings. Okay, the first of these um, hierarchies um, is Maslow's hierarchy of need. Uh, Maslow was a, a social psychologist working in the 1960s, predominantly uh, beginning his work in the 1960s, and he contributed towards uh, a, a study that led to the development of this particular hierarchy of need. And essentially what he argued in this hierarchy of need is that there are certain things, uh, certain conditions that have to be met before um, uh, learning can take place. And the first of these, right down at the very bottom of the hierarchy, is physiological. And what Maslow was talking about here was the need for uh, uh, warm food, clothing, um, refreshments, uh, access to loose, those sorts of things. Anything that actually determines your physical state of being at any one particular time. Um, so the analogy I often give to draw attention to that uh, is that if we were having this conversation perhaps face to face but outside in the cold and rain uh, this would be a very uncomfortable place to be and the chances of you wanting to stay uh, would be um, fairly uh, limited. The second level of the hierarchy is security and I'm assuming on the basis of the fact that you're, um, you're, you're coming into this webinar from either your home or your workplace that you feel reasonably secure, that you don't feel under any physical or emotional threat by virtue of the fact that you're attending this discussion. The third level is a sense of belonging and that is, I suspect, possibly harder to achieve in this sort of environment, that you're not aware necessarily of uh, one another's presence. I can see from the screen that there are currently 15 attenders uh, here in this space, but you don't, you're not aware of them, but Possibly we might sort of develop at least a, a proxy of uh, um, awareness of belonging to a particular group of people who are engaged in this discussion this evening. And the, um, the next level is that of esteem. And that's about valuing um, the situation that you find yourself in, whether it's uh, uh, the engagement with the subject matter or um, the way in which it might be contributing to other uh, aspects of your personal development. Maslow talked about these four um, uh, uh, levels that I've just described as being, um, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost, <laughs> I've lost my thread briefly. They, he described them as being um, essential ingredients uh, in uh, creating the situation whereby you can uh, achieve um, self-actualization. And that is, in fact, the, the next level. Self-actualization is the point at which you can actually um, begin to learn. 
in later years, um, uh, he added the, the very top level of this hierarchy, which he called transcendence. And tran transcendence is the capacity to create um, those uh, um, other uh, conditions in other people. So transcendence is the, uh, the capacity that you've got to be able to develop in order to uh, create a safe environment for, for people to learn. So that's uh, essentially the first uh, hierarchy. It's very, very much to do with the sort of uh, physical, emotional, uh, and experiential environment that you create for the learning event to take place. And at its most basic, you pay attention to um, lighting and heating in an environment. You need to pay attention, obviously, to any technology. Um, people need to have uh, appropriate coffee breaks. They've got to feel safe. You've got to engage in activities that make them um, feel comfortable with one another, so ice-breaking activities and that sort of thing are key ingredients in those elements. And they've got to feel as if that their experience and their contribution can be valued. And what, what Maslow argued was that uh, they, these were actually essential if people were going to um, learn. Okay, so the the second uh, tax, uh, the second hierarchy that I want to talk about is uh, is Bloom's taxonomy, often described as being the cognitive hierarchy. It was one of three hierarchies that were developed again in the middle of the last century. Um, the other two relating to affect, um, people's attitudes, and so on, and the the third one relating to um, psychomotor uh, ability. But Bloom's taxonomy specifically addressed issues around. Uh, um, our understanding, cognition. And this is what the overall hierarchy looks like. And what I'm going to do is to explore each of these levels in terms of uh, the way in which you could possibly think about framing questions and thinking about the sorts of uh, uh, challenges that you give to people. Um, so, right at the very, very bottom of the cognitive hierarchy are uh, knowledge type questions. And these are the sorts of things that allow you to ask questions like, what is the capital of Tibet? And uh, it's one of those questions that you either perhaps know the answer to, um, say you've been a stamp collector or something of that nature, or a, a, a fan and enthusiast of geography, or you don't know the answer to that question. Um, so that is right at the very bottom end. It's the sort of question that possibly would be asked um, in a pub quiz or on a, on a, on a quiz program on television. The second level of uh, the hierarchy is comprehension, and that might be demonstrated by a question like, what is the status of the capital within the Republic of China? And this is demanding a different sort of intellectual response to the, um, the, uh, the, the ideas that are uh, underlying that, that particular question. Uh, the third level addresses application. And the question that I've suggested here is how does the government of Tibet um, depend on the will of the Chinese Communist Party? And uh, this is a, a obviously, again, we're looking at something that is, is, a, uh, is more complex than we've had so far. And people are beginning to make use of the knowledge and understanding that they have of the political and geographical uh, issues in Tibet uh, uh, by looking at the way in which it actually has practical implications for, in this case, government. The next level, um, which is analysis, is, for example, here, explore the extent to which Tibet could be, could be considered to be autonomous. And you're beginning to um, uh, need um, a different sort of set of intellectual skills to explore this sort of issue. It's not simply having knowledge about Tibet, it's having knowledge about uh, notions of autonomy and the extent to which the information that you have about the social, economic and political circumstances in the country can contribute towards that particular issue. We then move towards the next highest level, which is um, uh, um, is uh, looking at the, ex, uh, the, the, the actual implications and analysis. So what are the consequences of increasing demands for independence? And in this particular setting, you're not even talking about Tibet, you will notice. We're talking in this particular situation about a synthesis of ideas and information that we're drawing from a whole number of different places. Um, 
And finally, we get to the very, very top, which is uh, evaluation. And the sort of question that we're asking there is to what extent is the regional cultural and linguistic autonomy a political reality for the 21st century? And what we're talking about here is the lessons that we've learned from an analysis of the situation in Tibet based on the earlier levels, uh, the lower levels in the hierarchy. We can now start applying that to a whole variety of related concepts in a whole variety of related environments, political, social, and so on. Um, so what we have is a situation whereby you are moving people up from um, the most basic level of, of, of information to increasingly complex levels of information. And the further you go up the hierarchy, the more likely you are to be drawing on um, information, uh, insight, um, and all of the other things that contribute towards the ability to answer that particular sort of question from a whole range of different sources. Among the things that this is a representative of is the notion of, um, of, uh, of novice to expert continuum. And um, uh, this is represented by, uh, at the very low level, simply having lots of knowledge about things, and right at the very top level, having a degree of expertise that, in some respects, people demonstrate um, uh, the capacity to be able to address issues without necessarily knowing the nature of their expertise. And this is one of the characteristic features of, uh, of expert performance, is that they don't necessarily know uh, what contributes towards that, uh, and which makes experts sometimes quite dismissive of the anxieties and concerns of uh, novices. So, for example, it's probably possible to answer some of the higher level questions in the cognitive hierarchy without knowing the capital of Tibet, but you do need to know the capital of Tibet in the first place. And I'm sure you can all think of, um, of analogies to that in your field of professional practice. Okay, so the next place that we head towards is um, exploring the way in which, slightly differently to what I've talked about so far, we can convert knowledge into um, uh, to experience. And experience, I suppose, is the more practical components associated with um, having knowledge and having access to certain ideas and certain uh, attributes. Um, Okay. You may or may not be familiar with the experiential learning cycle. Um, this had its origins in the early work of uh, a chap called John, John Dewey in the 1930s and was substantially redeveloped by David Kolb uh, in the United States in the 1970s onwards. And what you have here is uh, an opportunity to gain from experience. And I'd just like you to engage briefly in a, a, a thought experiment. Uh, it's now um, quarter to eight in the evening, and uh, you've probably had dozens and dozens of experiences throughout the day. And the likelihood is that the vast majority of those experiences you've not really thought very much about um, after them. You might have had a, a brief uh, exploration, possibly with a colleague, about something that's happened, but many, many experiences that we have we don't think about. What David Kolb and others have argued is that among the things that you're going to have to do if you're going to learn from experience is to go around the experiential learning cycle, and that's what we're going to have a, a brief um, visit uh, of now. The first, obviously, uh, the first element of this, and that's at the top of the cycle, as we saw in the earlier slide, is um, experience itself. And that experience can be anything from uh, a single event um, to uh, something that is, has got considerable amounts of complexity associated with it. Um, the next stage is um, something that called, called observation and reflection. And this has got two um, components, as you can see. And this can be, these can be converted into two quite simple questions. What happened? In other words, you uh, analyze and, and explore the events that took place, possibly in quite a lot of detail. And then you address the question, what did it feel like? And reflection is, in fact, um, quite uh, has a significant emotional territory associated with it. What was the impact of the experience that I just had on the way in which I felt about myself, about the circumstances I found myself in, about the colleagues that I was working with, 
how they reacted and so on and so on. So we're actually being willing to engage in a, a slightly more um, uh, thorough exploration than simply describing what happened, but actually looking at the things that, um, that, that those events evoked in terms of your emotional responses to things. The third stage is um, what does it mean, um, the conceptualization uh, stage, and answering the question what it, does it mean is an attempt to uh, explain um, what had happened as a consequence of the actions that had been taken. The somewhat frivolous 42 here uh, is a reference, for those of you who don't know, to Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, because 42 was the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Um, it's a, a minor aside, really, uh, that. Don't worry too much about it. The important issue here is this notion of being able to answer the question based on an experience, based on the observations that you have on it and your thoughts about those, those in the emotional reactions to that, what does the, this particular experience mean? And sometimes that can be a, an extremely important and key ingredient, but something that perhaps we don't want to think about too carefully because it may have implications for our practice. The third stage is actually addressing quite specifically that issue how can I change my practice as a consequence of the experiences that I've had and thought about and attempted to conceptualize about? What are the strategies that I may adopt if I was going to meet similar situations in the future? And you'll notice that the, um, the, the, the experimentation is, termed, uh, is phrased in terms of I rather than we. Um, because the argument is that it's easier to change yourself than it is to change other people, and that is possibly something that you might want to explore. The experimentation stage is the point at which you um, say, I'm going to have a go at doing something differently, and it is going to be not just in relation to the experience that I've had, but also from for, uh, relating to similar experiences that I may have had in similar sorts of situations. So it's not changing at the, the micro level necessarily, it's changing at the more macro. Okay. This is often thought of, particularly in the context of things like portfolios, which among the reasons you're here tonight, as being something that we do individually. And I want to talk in a moment or so about how we might do that more collectively. But I just want to uh, alert you to two potential sources of difficulty here. And I just need to go back um, a couple of slides uh, to allow me to do that. So when we look at uh, the experiential learning cycle, it looks as if it's something that you could go round quite readily from one to the next. But the fact is that there are a couple of serious barriers associated with uh, making your way around that experiential learning cycle. The first is the barrier that exists between experience and observation and reflection. And this is the point at which we have an experience, it may have been challenging, and we don't actually want to think about it or we find it embarrassing or uncomfortable or we just thought it was um, not something notable for us to worry too much about. So that's one of the first points of, um, of resistance in a sense that we may have towards learning from our experiences. We find it generally, it seems, um, relatively straightforward to go from observation and reflection down to abstract conceptualization. Because if you've made that first leap and you've started to analyze your um, process, um, you can uh, quite readily um, uh, move towards the abstract conceptualization. But the next barrier is between that point and experimentation. This is the point at which you find it really quite hard to think about how you might do something differently. And uh, that, again, is a challenge. And it's not an uncommon phenomenon for people to have an experience, possibly a, a negative one, to spend quite a lot of time thinking about that experience and thinking about its implications, uh, but then being resistant to the idea of changing their behavior as a consequence of that. So they continue to repeat their mistakes um, on and on. Okay. Okay, so quickly dashing through those again and coming to um, the whole notion of learning within the social context. Much of um, what I'm going to be talking about now is, is derived from work that was conducted initially in 
the, um, the USSR in the 1930s um, with a, 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 a chap called Vygotsky who was uh, interested in the way in which children learned language. Um, and uh, imagine the challenge you might face in learning Russian as a, as a, a, a toddler in the 1930s. Um, what he observed was that, uh, quite naturally, children learned Russian within a Russian-speaking context. Um, so they were acquiring vocabulary, they were acquiring structures, they were acquiring a sense of the sounds associated and the intonation patterns and so on and so on um, over a relatively extended period of time before they started to be productive users of, of, of language. Uh, this obviously applies as much to um, uh, learning English and learning French and German and so on as it did towards um, uh, l learning Russian. Uh, the important issue is that it was something that led to uh, quite considerable attention being paid to the fact that learning in fact was a social phenomenon and something that people could um, adapt and exploit in other settings other than the um, relatively informal setting of a child learning language. And it's increasingly been a feature of, uh, of, of learning in, um, in the adult community um, in the last 50 years or so uh, and probably beyond that people are going to learn very, very powerfully from each other. And if you think for a moment about your own work-based situation, the, the, the challenges that you faced in coming to terms with a new job, working with new colleagues, much of that is to do with the way in which you uh, gain insight into the way in which they function as a community. And uh, it's not simply the technical skills associated with the job, it's all of the other things that contribute to the way in which they organize themselves and manage things effectively. So what I'm emphasizing here is that there are incredible power to be gained from making use of people's uh, essential sociability and using that as a basis for their learning. And uh, this has implications for the way in which that happens, and I will be exploring those in the, um, the second seminar in this series uh, in, in a couple of months' time. One specific development that arose from uh, this particular work relates to the, uh, the development of material from um, two uh, uh, psychologists um, in the 1990s, um, this is a couple of people called Lave and Wenger, who developed the notion of uh, building on uh, Vygotsky's work of situated learning. Um, situated learning, quite simply, was a, a way in which uh, they used uh, to describe the experience of learning within work-based settings. And the focus of their initial explorations of these issues were some fascinating environments that included tailoring, um, recovering alcoholics and uh, things like that. Uh, they weren't specifically looking at uh, the professional practices perhaps that you uh, people are engaged in. What they did though was observe from a, a variety of perspectives the way in which people became part of, um, of an environment within which people um, learned the skills associated with things like being a tailor. And uh, among the things that they discovered within the context of that practice, for example, was that early, early uh, apprentices in, in tailoring um, spent an awful lot of time ironing new suits. Now, if you think about ironing a suit, that gives you access to a whole range of different insights, perhaps, into the construction of a suit. So the way in which the seams are constructed, the way in which cloth is cut, the way in which pockets form a part of it, the way in which overlaps and seams and all that sort of thing are key ingredients. And they were exposed to this, not directly by being taught, but by simply experiencing those sorts of things. So, uh, rough, briefly to make our way down this structure here, which is it's not entirely, it's not strictly a hierarchy, but I just thought it was helpful to organize it in, a, in this particular way so that I could talk about it in a little bit more systematic. So I'm going to ignore for the moment activity theory, we're going to come back to that in a moment, but essentially what situation, uh, situated learning talks about is the fact that people gather together 
to engage in certain sorts of practices. And what you see in this photograph here are a bunch of people uh, uh, in, a, in a, a holiday resort who are laying a new patio uh, and they're working together and they spent time working independently and the time huddled together deciding things and the time allocating tasks and so on and so on. And that community of practice was there to organize their, their activities and give them a, a basis of, uh, of effective um, use of their time, time and resources. At the next level down, we've got this notion of the zone of proximal development. And this is um, a very interesting uh, notion. It's, it's the idea that when you first come into an organization, there are things that you are going to be exposed to that perhaps you haven't been exposed to before. And this is the this is the essentially the zone of proximal development. This is based specifically on, on Vygotsky's work. And this is about being in a place where you are, have access to practices, uh, and, but you're not necessarily drawn directly into them in um, uh, 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 an active role. So you think about the, um, to return to Vygotsky's original source of his, his theory of the child learning language, uh, the zone of proximal development includes things like um, uh, the sort of talk that goes on between adults and very young children and the repetition and the, the, the word play and all of those other things that are very much features of that, that time. That is the sort of thing that might go on within the adult setting in terms of the zone of proximal development. People are exposed to a whole range of, of language, practices, conventions and so on. Part of the responsibility that organizations have to enable people to um, become more full members of the community of practice that is being represented is something called scaffolding. And scaffolding is the responsibility of more senior people who provide a, a structure that enable people to develop their skill set from what they can do to accepting increasingly um, challenging uh, um, roles within that particular uh, field of activity. And I'm sure you can think of examples of the way in which you were supported by more senior colleagues as you became more and more responsible for different sorts of things. This might include um, possibly taking things on that were slightly more challenging than you'd perhaps like them to be, but nevertheless were um, within your um, range of confidence and competence with a degree of support. Alongside that sort of possibly more psychomotor development, you've got this notion of the cognitive apprenticeship. And this is where you're gaining access through a variety of mechanisms to ideas, information, knowledge, and we can go back now to our cognitive hierarchy, and ways of thinking about certain sorts of things that allow you to gain access to the more sophisticated thought processes associated with a particular activity. So those are the sorts of things that are taking place perhaps within the zone of proximal development. Leven Wenger talks specifically about this notion of legitimate peripheral participation. And uh, it, there are three components to this. Um, legitimacy in the first place, am I the right person to be here? Um, um, is it okay for me to uh, represent myself here as a person who is competent within this sphere of activity? So you have to be there, you have to be the right person to be there. Peripheral is about being on the edges perhaps of an activity, not necessarily being right at the center, but having that capacity to be, um, to observe, to uh, engage in question and answer sessions and so on. Uh, as you can see going on around this activity here. And the third element of this is participation. This is about people actually being gain, uh, gaining access to taking part in the activity over a period of time. And alongside of all of that taking place, you've got the opportunity to learn practices and routines and listen to the stories and histories associated with those particular sorts of activities. And some of these are formal and relate directly to um, practices associated with your um, your engagement, and some of them are um, considerably less formal, but nevertheless are important components of the way in which people work together to actually achieve um, uh, satisfactory outcomes in their field of practice. So what you have in, in situated learning, uh, as represented here, ignoring for the moment activity theory, are, are some 
essential representations of what we find in the workplace that allows uh, experienced practitioners to work together and allows the development of the less experienced people by um, increasingly frequent and uh, challenging exposure to more difficult uh, tasks as they become more and more familiar and more comfortable with the way in which things need to be done. Just briefly to talk about activity theory, um, this was uh, de developed from Leven Wenger's work by uh, a, a professor at the University of Helsinki in Finland, and he, he depicted this particular um, or an, a version of this particular model uh, to describe what he means by activity theory. And this is a model that I developed uh, in the context of emergency medicine as part of the simulation um, program. And what essentially you have are some key ingredients uh, in this. So starting from the top of the triangle, you've got all of the diagnostic tools, medical records, and medical technology associated with managing medical emergencies in a, an emergency department. Um, here on the left hand side, you've got the clinical lead, the person who would take responsibility for the management, for example, of a major trauma in the ED. Down at the bottom left hand side, you've got all of the guidelines, checklists, and protocols associated with trauma management. Uh, you've got in the middle the support of other clinicians, nurses, and other healthcare professionals who might well be reasonably engaged in that. And within that body of people, you've got a series of levels of responsibility. Uh, that you would expect people to engage within. The patient, interestingly, is uh, an important ingredient in activity theory, as represented here, because that is the person that all of the actions um, that are taken by everybody engaged using the processes that they have and the resources available to them act on that particular individual to create a situation where there can be an accurate diagnosis treatment and discharge or further treatment. And all of those sorts of things combine in this relatively complex sort of environment, um, which uh, is productive, consumptive, and uh, has uh, the capacity for distribution and exchange and so on. So it's a fairly complex way in which we can describe things. And probably the best way to get some insight into an understanding of, uh, of how this particular model works is by taking any element away and looking at the possible consequences of something being missing. So you take away, for example, the diagnostic tools, medical records, and medical technology, and you've got serious limitations on what you can actually do to manage the patient effectively. Similarly, if you've no clinical lead, there's nobody who's going to take responsibility, perhaps, and you might have that fairly serious situation where leadership is um, devolved to the extent that nobody is actually taking responsibility. Issues around the absence of guidelines, checklists, and protocols, even though these often have a, a bad name, can create a situation where things are not done systematically, and if you don't have the support of other people and a sense of um, team leadership and membership, you may have also having problems, all of which would have potentially negative uh, implications for the treatment of the patient. So that's a little bit more about activity theory and um, uh, if it is something that we do uh, explore a little bit further in, in other settings, I'll be coming to in a little bit over uh, in a moment or so. So essentially, uh, at the heart of uh, what I consider to be these ingredients is the capacity that people have to talk to one another about what they're doing uh, and why. And cr by creating an environment where um, people can safely explore their concerns about things that have been taking place. and um, it may well be that this is something that is to do with the way in which uh, an organization develops a supporting and learning culture that if this is going to um, uh, um, be developed uh, satisfactorily and effectively. Um, I think there is a, a very interesting quote here from John Dewey, the original thinker behind the experiential learning cycle when he says that education must be conceived as a continuing reconstruction of experience. The process and goal of education are one and the same thing. The, the key words for me is that continuing reconstruction of experience and that is where the social element comes in. It's not just within your own head that you're having that exploration of the reflective um, uh, learning cycle. It's within the context of other colleagues where you can actually begin to challenge things that are possibly suboptimal and uh, possibly need um, working on to develop further. 
Okay, so uh, this is the point at which I can um, hand back over to Andrew to see whether there are any questions at this point that I can um, I can answer. So but thanks very much so far. Thank you, Mike. Uh, there isn't any questions currently. Uh, just some compliments saying okay. uh, how they've enjoyed the webinar. Um, there isn't anything outstanding. Uh, for you guys who have just joined us or joined us um, after my introduction, if you have got any questions, you can populate them now into the question box, which should be on either your right-hand side or indeed maybe at the top of your screen. Uh, and You simply just type your question in there and I will pause that to Mike. I did have a couple of questions earlier on by email. Um, and I'm just looking now frantically on my um, my phone to see whether I can find them. But in the in the in the in the meantime, if there's a, if there is anything else, uh, don't hesitate to to ask. Yeah, even once the um, the webinar is complete, I will um, forward over Mike's details, and so you can catch him on Twitter or you can um, drop him an email, and he will be more than happy to, uh, to answer your questions. And he's also featuring in some more webinars that we have. Um, coming up over the next few months and so you'll probably recognize his name on, uh, on some of the ability to uh... okay so we've got a question for you Mike okay when carrying out a reflection do you personally have a preferred process model oh that's an interesting that is an interesting question um, because I I will be quite honest about it and say that when I first came across reflection in the early 1990s I was fairly resistant to the idea of it being something that was a requirement of me um, and I it's not because I think I was opposed to the idea of reflection per se but I was not keen on any sort of formal process of it my view is that I was a reflective person who um, did it sort of fairly automatically I subsequently found that uh, a huge value in essentially just um, free associating with a pen in the hand and uh, writing down anything that pops into my head relating to something that has just happened to me and that is what I've done as a matter of, um, of routine I'll almost certainly be doing it in, in half an hour's time this evening where I'll just sort of jot down some of the thoughts that I've had about various aspects of the experience from my point of view so um, yeah that, that is my strategy I without necessarily responding to any particular prompts I pick up a pen and and start writing having said that I tend to find myself um, responding to the question what happened what did it feel like what did it mean as a, a pretty much as a matter of routine it, it is a sort of reasonably helpful um, organizing principle for me that I've sort of looked at and thought well that seems to be what I'm doing here okay. Yeah, I think that's answered the question. I think reflective practice is something that, that is personal to you as an individual. And even though we have got lots of prescriptive methods, for example, Gibbs or John's, or even um, the crash model, which we feature within CBME, I think it's important yeah. that, that reflective practice is, is down to you as an individual. And even if you don't follow um, the models, perhaps of some of these academic models as such, it is important, as you said, Mike, just to make notes um, for your personal um learning and development and to identify any future learning needs that might come or arise from a situation. Yeah. I did have the experience on one occasion of uh, when I was, I, I did work in Manchester for a number of years and uh, I had a particularly powerful experience in, a, in some groups that I was engaged in and I got lost going home and given that this was a journey that I made every day of my working life um, but obviously in one direction through the centre of Manchester and uh, the fact that I got lost on that particular occasion showed the extent to which I was sort of engaged in exploring my experiences pretty much in my head um, but it was later that I started to use pen and paper to capture some of those thoughts. Yeah interesting, interesting theory. Uh, I think that is it for our questions and so I will okay. just um, quickly take back my um, screen if I can. Just two things, if I may. Um, if for more uh, information on these issues, you may want to have a look at either of these two books that uh, are available um, through Amazon. And uh, there are my contact details again. Um, uh, essentially, what we've looked to be able to do this evening is explore that briefly those um, 
a couple of hierarchies and look about learning from experience within the context of spatial practice. Thank you very much indeed. Perfect. And I will forward you all a copy, um, a digital recording of this webinar, so you can, um, as I said, use it for future learning development, or you can indeed um, use it for your own reflection. Uh, there is just one question which has just come through there, Mike, at the last. Um, do you consider group reflection amongst colleagues to be commonplace in your experience, and how do you engage in this without a blame culture coming to fore? I think that's a really, really important question. Um, my personal experience is that it wasn't particularly something that I found people necessarily ready to do because they felt a little bit vulnerable because it does have that potential for people to um, be sort of held accountable or held responsible when things don't go particularly well. But I think it is something that is incredibly rich as, a, a, as an opportunity. And when it has been created effectively by... Um, good leadership it's it's certainly well worth doing yeah i agree i agree it's something we, we tend to do in emergency medicine or we used to do historically uh, perhaps when we weren't quite as busy we'd go back to the mess room and we'd discuss incidents and reflect upon them uh, and have yeah. a difference of opinion within practice and so uh, that, yeah that's an interesting theory um Dr. Mike Davis, thank you very much indeed for coming with us this evening and um, answering all the questions uh, as always it's always a pleasure for those people um, who have taken part in the webinar tonight, you again will get a digital copy of the certificate, which will be sent to you by email. But if you are a member of CPDME, as I discussed, it will automatically appear in your CPDME diary section. So that just leaves you to, to pop into there and fill in some of the gaps, for example, what you've learned from this um, interesting webinar tonight and how it might influence your practice. For those people who are interested in taking part in some more webinars, um, this is one of the new features of CPDME, and we've started plowing lots of um, effort and, um, and interest into finding some varied speakers for you. So tomorrow night, for example, we have got a webinar on managing um, trauma, uh, but more importantly, managing um, hemorrhagic injuries or, or life-threatening um, catastrophic injuries, and that is presented by uh, Andy Thomas. So you can register now by going to cpdme.com slash webinar and that webinar is available tomorrow and then next week we have the gentleman who developed and designed the um, Lewis pelvic applicator uh, so I've actually got the man himself who's behind this piece of kit and he's available to um, have a webinar discussion with from the 22nd of January 2016. Uh, all that's left to say is thank you very much for your coming tonight uh, if you do have any questions please send us to by email I will send you all a digital copy of this video and of course you will get your certificates in the um, in the next hour or so but uh, that all that is to say is thank you very much for your time tonight mike thank you very much and uh, have a safe journey thank you and good night everybody thank you